what is to be done. Uh, a webinar supported uh, by the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Middle East, North Africa, uh, uh, staff of the International Secretariat. Um, this is a collaboration across sections of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. So you will hear speakers uh, from uh, sections in Lebanon, Palestine, Norway, and the US. This is our expression of solidarity in the feminist peacemaking movement. Uh, and the moderators for our webinar today are Barbara Taft of the Middle East Peace and Justice Action Committee of the U.S. Section, and George Friday of the Black Liberation Caucus of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, U.S. Section. I'm Teresa Elamine. I'm a member of the Black Liberation Caucus and a member of the Fannie Lou Hamer branch of the U.S. Section of Will. Uh, thank you. And Barbara, George, and Yasmin, if you could move us forward. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Uh... I'll just start with a few quick housekeeping rules to make sure that uh, anyone who needs interpretation has uh, technical uh, or technical assistance has access. Um, I'll start with uh, in English and then I will repeat the presentation in uh, uh, in Arabic as well. Um, برزنتيشن سريع لل يعني خاصة التجمع والمسائل التقنية هبدا باللغة الإنجليزية وبعدين هعيد المعلومات بالعربي. Um, if you are joining us from your computer, you will see an icon like what you see on my screen now uh, at the bottom right uh, of your uh, screen. Um, please click on it and select the language that you prefer, either English or uh, Arabic, and uh, so that you only hear the uh, interpretation and not uh, all the, uh, the channels, just please select mute original audio. Uh, if you're joining us from your phone, you will find, you see these three dots uh, as you see on my screen, uh, just tap language interpretation and select the language. And once again, just uh, the language. Uh, please use the Q&A fun function to ask panelists questions and there would be a discussion uh, section at the end um, to answer to all your questions. And you can use the chat function if you have any technical questions. Uh, the chat function will be disabled during the time of the presentation of the speakers and then it will be enabled again um, at the end. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and we will send uh, a uh, the recording by email to you within a couple of days and of course as always we want to ensure a safe space during this event and if you have any uh, if you encounter any issues please e uh, use the email uh, on the screen now uh, and to connect with us uh, uh, icon or uh, a zayl mawjud ala shasha dalwati ala yimin shasha mungkin nadrat aliha ala shen access al tajama bil Arabi or bil English wa ala shen man smash kol al kanawif nafs dalwati bas nadrat ala mute original audio min al mobile fi nusa ala talat nuqat zayl mawjudin ala shasha wa nxtar bardo al lugha Arabiya or Englishia wa uh, mute original audio عشان ما نسمعش القنوات الأخرى. Uh, ممكن نستخدم ال Q&A function أو الأسئلة والأجوبة لأي uh, أسئلة للمتحدثات وال chat function للأسئلة التقنية أو لو حد بيجي أي مشكلة chat function هيبقى uh, uh, 
هيبقى متوقف في وقت البرزنتيشن بتاعة المتحدثات وبعدين هنرجع نشغله تاني الويبينار بيتم تسجيله وهنرسل نسخة منه لبعد بعد ال الايفنت واخيرا بنأكد ان دي مساحه امنه ولو واجهتكم اي مشاكل ممكن تستخدموا الايميل اللي على الشاشه للتواصل معانا شكرا and back to you Barb. I was two years old when the state of Israel was created. One of my earliest memories is of watching the news on our tiny black and white TV with my Ukrainian Jewish father. People were carrying their children and belongings on their backs, crossing a shallow river. They suddenly looked back, terror on their faces. I recall my father letting out a deep sigh and saying, those poor Palestinians, it frightened me and the image replayed in my childhood nightmares. Several years later, while in college, I saw the newsreel again in a movie, and I learned why they were so afraid. Friends and family members had stayed behind, refusing to be driven out as their homes were blown up on top of them near Jericho. The population of Palestine in 1948 was still 61% Palestinian Arab, land ownership by Jews was less than 12%. Today, Israel controls 78% of the land, although the population is about equally divided among Palestinian Arabs and Israeli Jews. And the state of Israel wants to take over the other 22%. Hanan Awad, our first speaker, will be showing you a video about Israelis' attitudes toward their Arab neighbors. Steeped in propaganda, they believe the Palestinian Arabs are terrorists who are stealing their land and not the other way around. I couldn't help but see parallels between that attitude and what is happening now in Ukraine. It's the same story being repeated, but I wish that the world had paid as much attention to the plight of the Palestinians as they are now to that of the Ukrainians. See if you don't agree. Hanan, you're on. You're still on mute, Hanan. Oh, you hearing me? Yes, we can hear Uh, would you would you like me to share the video, uh, Dr. Hanan? You want me to speak now? <clears throat> yeah. Would you like me to share the video uh, first, or um, not me? I think they will uh, show the video, not me, because it doesn't have it now. I send it to Barbara. 
Yeah, you can show it to them. <clears throat> The, 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 the Islam is a, it's a very bad disease, not, uh, not just for Israel, for uh, all around the world, we, we can see it. I also am an organization, it's called Lahava, it's against the Jews should they marry Arabs, because Jews is a special nation that God gave it to the Jews, and we don't want Jews to get mixed up with it, together with a different nation. I think Israelis have to take over, and uh, they have to kick them, uh, kick them away. It will be much better not to, not to kill them, just to to go back to to Arab countries. You can't deal with these people. There's no need to try. There's no need to talk to them. What we can do is when that they, they do enough harm, we retaliate. That's war, and that's the situation that any Jew who lives in Israel has to deal with. I think also that um, every Arab that doing a terrorism attack, uh, we have to kill him. And not because he's an Arab, because he's a terrorist. I think you should uh, also kick out the family, because it all begins with whatever they teach the kids, the kids... It does, you know, it's families. I, I think we should give them a country. If you're doing any problem, you just go in there to give them a country and then it's going to be a war between countries, you know. If they're going to throw rockets, we're going to throw one big one and done. I don't think there's any answer to it. Really? There's only one way, like, I would carpet bomb them. You would That's, carpet bomb them? It's the, only, it's the only way you could deal with it. Like, or, or try to stop them a different way. It, it never worked. You mean all Arabs are Gaza or...? I, I believe that they... Like, I hope to believe they're, they're not, but I do think they are. Because I never... I don't, I don't trust them. You can't trust them. And that's the only way I believe that. The only, the only way is just to stop it completely. We need to kill the uh, Arabs. <laughs> <laughs> Your comments, Hanan? Okay. Shall I start? Please. Okay. <clears throat> On the edge of Volcano, dear friends from all over the world, I salute you from behind the, behind the barbed wire, from the capital of the occupied Palestine, from the screams of mothers, the cry of the children, and from the people's hope for freedom. Dear friends, what's the value of a man without a homeland without a banner and without a fixed address. Palestine is the fixed address. Living refuge in our country under Israeli occupation and illegal expansion, under justified killing and apartheid is the reality of our life. How can my pen outburst to transport portraits that did not exist even in the old region and not even in the history crime which were recorded letters of subjugation. And how can I converse on the rivers of blood that leaks through the corridors of our country? What shall I say? And the torture of women, the strains of horror, and the wails and lament. What shall I say? And the silence of the big powers allow the horses of poison, of poison to inflict us in a genocide journey. Are we human beings? or merely a glowing destiny bird from existence. The incubation with towering presence is stand with pride in an entire with a tank of burning. This is our real situation. Some details. Advanced plan to build 700 units in East Jerusalem. Many houses were destroyed. A great number of young people were intentionally killed. Sheikh Jarrah in the heart of Jerusalem is under threat. Silwan also. 
every corner in Palestine is under violation. The big question lie in the hands of the US, declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Since then and before Jerusalem became a target for the occupation, no land left, the city was changed with the march of occupation. The peace initiative declared two-state solution Palestine state on the borders of pre-1967 war. The question to be asked, where is the border of 1967 when the occupation stole the land and built settlement changed the image of our capital? Where's the peace when Israel's systematic state terrorism and apartheid and heinous crimes against Palestinians mark its existence? Where's the peace when we see children under age in prison like the young child Ahmed Manasra. Where is the peace when the prisoner Nasser Abu Hamid faces the most criminal act of, of horror, leaving him suffering and facing death without treatment and many other stories of the prisoners and also the women with torture, especially the women prisoners with the difficult situation that they experience. Where is the peace when we are refugees in our country? No freedom of movement, no freedom of expression, no freedom of worship, no life protected, except checkpoints scattered in the entrances of the cities, forbidding people from entering Jerusalem, raiding the mosque in every day with the protection of the police and soldiers, beating Palestinians inside the mosque, including women and children. In another world, the Israeli army initiate wars against Palestinians in daily basis. Intention to kill without any reservation, collective imprisonment, raiding refugee camps, confiscated land to expand the settlement's torture. Torture prisoners, a war against, especially, this is very important uh, note, a war against schools and education, to change the Palestinian text. Attacking church all over, forbidding Christians from practice their religion. More taxes imposed in Jerusalem people, threatening the Palestinians, taking out their identity, shooting Palestinian by the Sitlan in the bypasses road, attack the field and burn the streets. A sudden news for any Palestinian family in killing son or husband, even in the wedding party. They come at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning. Killing leaders in Nablus, in Jenin, in all parts of Palestine, especially in Gaza. Where's the peace when Gaza under blockade and wars resulted with hundreds of martyrs and injured and destruction of houses and institution led to poverty and lack of electricity and health service. Now, the last war in Gaza on, on the 8th of August 2022 was a true mark of crimes, caused more than 45 martyrs, including women and children, using Palestinian blood as a mean for their elections. Leading Gaza and leading figures and many other innocents around them, 33 martyrs this year in Jenin, and the last is Hamid Abu Jilda. Targeting innocence every day. This is a little from the reality. Where are the resolution of Palestine since long time, waiting with dust on the shelves of the United Nations? Why it were not implemented? Truly, truly, we cannot count the number of people who were killed by the occupation soldier in Gaza, the West Bank, inside Jerusalem, and the historic Palestine. We cannot also count the number of prisoners of conscience in Israeli jails and the torture they face. Where are the olive trees which were burned by the occupation and settler, attacking and shooting journalists to hide the truth, like Shireen Abu Akhle and many others? Where is the Palestinian time lies when we spend long hours on the checkpoint? Where is the international law when Israel is standing on the edge of law, negates all articles. Occupation soldiers can raid the cities and villages at any time without reservation and respect 
to the international law. Detain children in the military court, kill innocents and confiscate their bodies and forbid families to bury them in addition to destroy their homes. It is to name but a few. Official policy of the occupation is the policy of slaughter the Palestinian. It makes it easier for them to deny their existence by arrest and torture and by policy to, call, to kill. And oppose the human rights declaration and international law. Closing offices of human rights in Jerusalem and in Ramallah, including the General Union of Palestinian Women, claiming that they have acts of terror. How shame to say this with the silence of the big powers. How shame to enter Ramallah, which is supposed to be a area, which means liberated city. What a shame for resolution to declare Jerusalem as only belonging to the occupation as declared on the 6th of December, 2017 by President Trump. A president of the great power distributed Palestine and gave as a gift Jerusalem to the occupation as if it is his family inheritance, continued by President Biden stressing the state policy and the support for occupation, leaving aside the Palestinians without practical promises, claiming that there will be now no two-state solution, but economic solution. Palestine now is recognized by 138 of the 193 member states on the name, the state of Palestine. It is time to be fully recognized to take its role with the free nations in equal footing. Palestine children have the right to be saved in their homes. Palestine people and refugees have the essential right to return to their country. <clears throat> the conclusion, enough is enough. 70, 40 years of occupation is more than enough. It is the time to report the truth. It is the time to declare reality. It is the time for honest in intervention by third power of the international community. It is also British responsibility. The resolution, the resolutions are up to implementation. Recognition of the state of Palestine as full member on the border of pre-1967 with East Jerusalem as its capital. The recognition is very important. It will give hope. It is the first step towards peace and justice. Stop sending arms to Israel and money. The settlement has to be stopped, evacuated and dismantled. International protection for the Palestinian people have to be realized. All resolution concerning Palestine must be practiced. Free the prisons, punish the occupation for its crimes against Palestine. The criminal court has to act. The last illegal occupation in the world must be ended. It is the time for the occupation to devour free Palestine. What does it mean? to be a Palestinian when your flesh is, is torn into pieces of pale color? What does it mean to stay a Palestinian and determined to, break, to protect your Palestinian ship when you are fully tortured and crucified? Where is the voice of humanity? Dear friends and sister, you, the free thinkers and the solidarity group, can change the ugly face of the occupation. We, the Palestinian, we are pledged to support peace and justice and dignity for a full freedom. Allow me on behalf of the Palestinian people to pay tribute to the Middle East Committee in the US section and to all the friends and to Barbara, to Teresa, to everybody. I don't want to forget any name. Barbara is a boy too, you see. And all the friends and whoever put a hand in such important meeting, I would like to thank them very, very much and assure all of you that we will keep on in the road of peace and justice for Palestine. 
are for anybody in the world. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Hanan. And now we'll hear from a representative from the Lebanon section, Hala Kalani. Hala? Hello, everyone. Greetings from Lebanon. Uh, thank you for joining us and for your solidarity. Um, I am going to start with a small back with some background of this um, small country because it it, it, it does impact um, the the way the understanding of the current context. So Lebanon is a small country in the Eastern Mediterranean that witnessed the crossing of many civilizations. After the fall of the Roman Empire of the Ottoman Empire, the country fell under the French mandate and gained independence in 43. It's, it is surrounded by Syria uh, from the north and east and Israel from the south. It is home to 6 million people and uh, these people belong to many sects, religious sects, and these in total are 18 sects. The French and other foreign influences traditionally reinforced one community over, the, over another. They gave some communities more power than the others, and this created many intercommunal conflicts and civil wars. The first was in 1860s between uh, the Druze sect and the Christians in the mountains. The French also left much ambiguity in the um, power structure and the governance structure. So they created a confessional system that plagues the country till today. We do, we like the, the leaders of the country are chosen not for merit, but for um, the, the, the sect that they represent. So, so Lebanon was always affected by region regional and international tensions and conflicts. It has been a playground for many conflicts. So the Arab-Israeli wars uh, affected the country a lot. And we received a flux of refugees from Palestine since 1948. It also lived through a devastating civil war from 1975 to 1990. Uh, it also included the Israeli invasion of Beirut and at the time, the Israelis sponsored the massacre of Palestinian refugees in uh, what we call Sabra and Shatila camps. It made uh, headlines around the world. The, the war ended in, in, in a peace accords between um, uh, the, the different Lebanese factions and in an accord that is called the Taif Accord, but there was no accountability no justice for the victims. Only when one of the party leaders that engaged in the conflict went to prison, the others actually um, stepped into power positions, leading the country to the current collapse we are in. So we we since then we haven't known peace. It's a it's a very very vulnerable and unstable country. And Israel has a free hand to pound the country whenever it desires. And we are constantly seeing violations of our airspace. Uh, there's been um, uh, several wars waged by Israel, like the one in 2006, where we've had um, many massacres. They've even attacked people who took refuge in, 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 in UN camps, like what you see here in the picture. It's called the Kana massacre of 1996. 250 Lebanese were killed. And um, the yeah, uh, there was also other um, uh, attacks where entire families, families were wiped out. Wiped out. Um, we also had our fair share of, of, of problems when the Syria conflict broke out. And we had, um, we, Lebanon now hosts the highest number of displaced people per capita. This has created a huge strain on, on the, the country's economy and, and environmental resources. Uh, now Syrian Lebanese communities are competing for jobs and food in, mid, in the midst of one of the harshest economic and fi financial crises 
worldwide. For several years now, Lebanon has been assailed by compounding crises, specifically an economic and financial crisis, followed by COVID, the COVID crisis, and lastly, you probably all heard of the Beirut port explosion on August 4, which um, killed more than 215 people and left many others injured. Traditionally, parties in, parties in power established a failed system that nurtured corruption, sectarianism, clientelism, racism, and patriarchy. These have been reinforcing one another, producing an unbearable environment and driving the country into collapse and driving many youth to leave the country. This is why people in October 2019 rose. They protested against the system. From the very beginning, the protests of the protests, women have been on the front lines. One of the first violent moments that galvanized the movement was the footage of a woman kicking an armed security guard who threatened to open fire on protesters. Women have inspired the revolution, led the movement, and protected it from the machinization of authority. If the spirit of this movement is about righting the wrongs brought on by sectarianism, poor governance, and, go and corruption, we must recognize the specific and disproportionate injustices women experience in this country. The challenges brought on by Lebanon's poor public services and sinking economy are especially amplified for poor women and women in neglected regions, domestic migrant workers, refugees, and sexual minorities among other marginalized groups. In, other, in, on, in no uncertain terms, women are discriminated against in the country's laws, economic practices, and social and political norms. Since 2019, we have been facing this collapse. We have lost, um, the, our Lebanese pound lost 90% of its value, debt to GDP reached 150%, food prices have skyrocketed. We are, um, People lost their money in, in, uh, in the banks that are complicit with the politicians. Three, now three quarters of the Lebanese population live in poverty. And um, yeah, that was all compounded, as I said, by the, the, by the explosion. And the economy and public sector to continue to um, suffer after, in the aftermath. These crises have, um, of course, impacts on the environment and people's health that in a way that it's not yet fully understood. Um, it's also feeling, Lebanon is also feeling the war in Ukraine uh, because we import 80% of our wheat from there. And people are now uh, in, in shortage of wheat, oil, and people are just fighting over food and crime rates have been also skyrocketing so has been domestic violence. So um, you can see the long queues that people um, spend their time in. We have no electricity, no power, uh, no water. Um, and the banking sector, as I said, has failed people. Uh, and we have been living under strict capital controls and illegal capital controls. Uh, there's no more lending. Um, and uh, we have now like a very complicated system where you have um, a difference between your dollar deposits before 2019 and any dollars, which we call fresh dollars coming after. Uh, the former is subject to sharp deleveraging through the fact of lirification and haircuts up to 80% of dollar deposits. The burden of the ongoing adjustment and leveraging is highly regressive falling hardest on small depositors and small medium enterprises. The Lebanese lira continues to lose value as inflation rates remain in the triple digits. So what do we need? We need justice. We need to hold these corrupt politicians to account. Um, we need reliance on the international law and systems and we need, we need sanctions to reach uh, more politicians than the usual suspects. Um, it needs to be blanketed to all the politicians. We have many politicians who have interests in the Western world, uh, many deposits in many countries. There are only 1% of these people sanctioned. Um, 
human rights organizations should mobilize, depositors' cases should reach justice, the bank owners should be held into account to account uh, for international mon monetary crimes. Some, some of them are US citizens, so they can be tried in, in, in the US, for example. And, and your solidarity and your mobilization with us would be very helpful. The, in the UK, depositors were able to file cases. Uh, politically exposed people should be held into account. The government should implement the International Convention Against Corruption, which cancels banking secrecy. It can impose sanctions on criminals. A list of sanctions can be taken against people who committed these crimes. Switzerland and France went against the governor of our central bank, but the US just moved against one of the politicians and some of the other politicians. We want mobilization against everyone and we want the US to activate its role to, to criminalize Lebanese politicians. We are exposed to systemic crimes of corruption and international financial crimes. Most politicians have, as I said, accounts in the US and ally countries. They shouldn't be encouraged to continue their corruption. Support, we need support for Lebanon section to conduct a campaign for the implementation of this convention. We need capacity building um, and media mobilization. Uh, we will also want uh, support in a project we are now developing to support international law in delineating the borders of Lebanon. As you know, Israel is looking to steal more land and um, some, some resources, important resources. And it would be great if we would be supported as Wolf section to have a meeting with the Congress. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ella. That's a lot. We've heard a lot so far. And our next speaker, who is a member of Wolf from Norway, will share a bit about an important piece that sadly is very vital for young people. And that's Solfred Rockness. Solfred. Oh, thank you. And uh, please uh, share my, uh, my uh, slides. So, uh, next slide. I'm, uh, I've been thinking about how to create peace. And the more I've been working on, on building uh, social and emotional uh, skills in youth, the more I've been reflecting on how peace can be created in young people. Uh, and that actually working with, how we deal with emotions is crucial uh, to build peace long-term. Because what is building peace? I think building peace is very much about how we actually solve the biggest problems. Uh, next slide, please. At the moment, we do have a leadership uh, crisis in the world. And we also have, at the same time, a global mental health crisis amongst young people. Only a minority of young people have access to evidence-based mental health supports. And at the same time, we know that interventions are helpful and can be upscaled for a low cost per, per, uh, per person. And if we dare to put more uh, energy and, uh, and seriousness into, into uh, investing in, in youth, I think that is part of the solutions to, to several problems at the same time, because today's youth, they are tomorrow's leaders, they're tomorrow's problem solvers, they are tomorrow's uh, peace builders. Next slide, please. What we have done, and I don't say that this is the solution to everything we are talking about, but I think it's a, a crucial uh, part of it uh, can be if it's upscaled. Um, we, have a, we have made a social and emotional learning app for adolescents. 
that is launched and implemented in Norway and Lebanon. And we have studied the impact on youth in, in Lebanon and on the pilots also in Jordan, US and uh, Norway are starting up in Ukraine. Um, next slide, please. In this application that is used as a blended learning program, uh, we have 10 scenarios where the adolescents actually game uh, to learn more about how to deal with difficult situations. We start lightly, like how to dare to, uh, help, uh, to give a presentation or how to deal with criticism. And then we are gradually like approaching more difficult themes that unfortunately are also highly frequent in our life like how to deal with rejection or how to handle a depressed mother. And all of this is not only for helping yourself, but help, helping your friends to deal with difficult situations. Also suicidal thoughts, how to deal with the worst memories and how to actually dare to speak out so that you use the vo your voice to, to, uh, to solve biggest, the biggest problems and what you actually think is important. Next slide. Does it work? We have done research on this and what have we found? Next slide. The adolescent themselves say, and this is qualitative data, that it helps. I'm a better problem solver now, they say, and they recommend their games, the game to, to their friends. And they've, they experience that this program is helping them not only to express their feelings, but also to cope better with with stress and to go from being anxious of, of uh, speaking in front of uh, their uh, peers at school to being more confident and also not only being more confident with themselves but being kinder to each other and um, and also it's kind of a normalization of how to deal with different pro problems like going from thinking about that that uh, that is something private to something more uh, that is important to talk about and uh, deal with together. Next slide, please. Number wise, on, the, on our uh, quantitative data, we find this, uh, the same that when we put this game into a program, the well being of their and anxiety level decreases a lot, so that about 5% of the adolescents after these 10 sessions are, still have uh, anxiety and depression, depression symptoms, often reduced from a start of 40 to 50%. Next slide, please. And what we have... What we also have done, and this is what I'm most proud about, is that we have not only implemented these group programs as PSS groups, but we have uh, these some of these adolescents who, who want to and who are um, a fine, a phone to have uh, good talents in, in um, affecting other uh, adolescents. We are giving them a little bit of, of uh, training to be peer supporters. And what we have found that, and some of these again, they form a youth board. They help us not only to change the game we have created, but also like thinking loudly about what is needed to create peace and to create better mental health in our communities. Uh, they are working at, or doing work, doing uh, tasks doing affecting their societies as mental health advocates, not only through spreading the games and being super spreaders like that, but through talking with their grandparents about hmm, what's, uh, uh, what is smart to do when you feel lots of sorrow in your heart and how do we keep sane in this world? And uh, they create groups with uh, adolescents from everywhere and they do like small little TikTok videos and Instagram things about important things. Next slide. I love to, uh, to uh, tell you more if I get the chance. Uh, and we are looking for partnerships for, for upscaling what we uh, are doing. 
and so that that can reach out to to more adolescents. So please uh, keep in touch and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Solfred. We really appreciate that. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Lucy Murphy, who is a Washington DC based civil rights and anti-war activist, as well as a jazz and blues musician. She'll be teaching us a song about Palestine. I understand that she wants us to sing along, but for technical reasons, we will need to stay on mute as we do this. But don't be shy about singing while you're on mute. Now let's welcome Lucy Murphy. I was, uh, well, greetings and salutations to everyone. Uh, I was hoping that you would play the YouTube that I sent. Um, Yasmin, is that possible? Yes. You can't help but say the word Palestine. People there have lost their land. Some have lost their home. They live in other countries. Their freedom almost gone. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. There seems to be no answer to give us the reason why people cannot live so no one has to die. We gotta take a stand for freedom. Take a stand for truth. Take a stand for justice. That's what we've got to do. Cause Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. People there are rich. People there are poor. Some have education. So what are they fighting for? Fighting for their freedom. Fighting for their land, fighting for their children. Let's help them take a stand. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine needs our love. Palestine needs her freedom. Palestine. We need a new beginning. Let us plant the seed. Plant the seed of love. Let that love seed grow. Plant the seed for everyone so all the world will know that Palestine needs her freedom.
And uh, with that, I turn it back to Barbara. Thank you, Lucy. That was great. Later, we'll be hearing a little bit more from Lucy, and um, we look forward to it. Right now, I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Nada Farhat. She's a member of our US Middle East Peace and Justice Action Committee, or MEPJAC. And not only is she a member of US WILF living in Connecticut, but she remains a member of the Lebanon section as well. She spent several months of this past year trying to help in various projects in Lebanon, which she'll be telling us about. Nada? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for listening tonight. My voice is not that clear. I'm not feeling well. I arrived in Lebanon two days ago, but I hope you can hear me well. Um, as we all know about nations, very simple. Lebanon, for example, is facing an unprecedented set of constitutional, sovereign, political, economic, and social crises that threaten the country's identity. This past May, Lebanese voters in Lebanon and abroad made it clear that they want to see a new class of rulers. Uh, in voting for a new parliament, uh, they elected representatives who campaigned on fighting corruptions, holding everyone accountable and opposing the anti-reformist majority of previous governments. A hope is banked on these new representatives to address immediate reforms, apply faith in the government, and and most importantly, reject militia control, hoping to restore the neutrality of Lebanon's foreign policies as a strong nation. And for Lebanon, because uh, like Barbara said, I, I am Lebanese. I spent most of my recent time, uh, the past two years in Lebanon, and uh, um, I hate to see another country in the Middle East, in the region, uh, going to the direction of destruction and uh, my heart goes with the Palestinians that they are, we are one country and we feel together and we feel our country now is going uh, toward destruction as well. So I believe that really the Lebanese political groups can put their differences aside and elect the president this September who is fully committed to the sovereignty of the country and committed to reforms in all sectors. The next six weeks in Lebanon dictate the next six years in the country. History had taught the Lebanese people to, uh, uh, to view every political change in the country and the region as a Western influence, to serve a Western goal, to help a Western power reach what they want to reach. History has repeated itself many, many times since the First World War. Um, in her testimony before the House uh, Affairs Subcommittee on the Middle East, and I want to bring it back to America because our discussion today also talks about what can we do. So I want to concentrate on that, uh, if you don't mind. In her testimony before the House Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Middle East, North Africa and Global Counterterrorism, Mona Yaobian, uh, Yaqubian, uh, the senior advisor of the vice president of the Middle East and North Africa, testified on July 29 on the implications of US policies. Yaqubian said, um, uh, she said, uh, Lebanon's downward spiral accelerates the United States along with its European and Gulf allies and key multilateral institutions should redouble efforts to prevent a total stale state collapse in Lebanon. Otherwise, the chaos, humanitarian catastrophes and security breakdown could threaten regional stability and potentially transform Lebanon irreversibly into a basket case country marked by poverty extremism, insecurity, and managing the impacts of post-collapse Lebanon, if even possible, would be far costlier for the international community. Yeah, Ubian, she, uh, she said the US can provide additional humanitarian aid. They could maintain pressure to ensure immediate cabinet formation, followed by steps to implement reforms and accountability measures. They could provide additional support to the Lebanese armed forces. They could harness the expertise and financing of the Lebanese diaspora. They could increase a system funding for US education programming. And they could, exp they could expand also USAID's economic growth and programming in the country. So the question here is, how can the international community help save Lebanon? Well, the international community came through to aid Beirut after the port explosion. 
in August of 2020. That caused at least 204 deaths, 7,500 injuries, $15 billion in property damage, and left an estimated of 300,000 people homeless. International aid arrived to the country in huge numbers from Arab nations as well as Western states. Medical supplies, food parcels, and monetary help flooded the civil society and the local non-governmental organizations in hope of rebuilding the city. Um, local humanitarian organization helped rebuild and freed the wounds of those still bleeding from losing a loved one or from losing everything they have. What I like to point out today is really not merely compounded in the material aid. It lies in the long-term policies and practices of powerful Western nations on Lebanon and the region. Stemming from a geopolitical map, allow me to go back a little bit in history, from a geopolitical map drawn back in 1917 when the Balfour Declaration was signed and the British mandate on Palestine was in promising Lord Rothschild a land for the Jewish people in what was then part of the Ottoman Empire, Secretary Balfour was compelled to deliver on his promise. The Zionist movement in England did not waste time. The memorandum was click quickly circulated, changing the future of Palestine forever, changing the fate of the whole region because the Zionist movement in Israel made sure they used the influence of Western nation for their favors. And I, I uh, as Hala showed you in the slide, uh, we are um, border with Israel. So uh, we are hit first, uh, we see it, um, in any way, we are constantly bombarded and, and targeted from Israeli army. Um, so the influence of Western nation uh, to their favor, and I want to say especially the United States, um, what may seem now to the world like a struggle of power in Lebanon or could lead to full destruction of all, all we have to do is look at Palestine. Even the hope of a two state is paid for with lives and agony today. And dim hope is clowning over. Lebanese are facing a crucial junction in their national presence and identity. Weakening this country can only benefit other neighboring states and lead to a transformation in the region. And this, this is my opinion. This is, uh, I think, um, I think uh, if you research the history of the Western involvement in the region, you will know what I'm talking about. We have to pay attention to today to the border discussion, uh, really the maritime border and land border. As Lebanon border has been abused with Syria, the north of Lebanon, um, Lebanon's protected goods are shipped to Syria daily, uh, illegally as the, as the Lebanese suffer. And now the gas pipelines discussion between Israel and Lebanon, nobody summarizes this better, really this aspect better than my friend and fellow Wolf US member, investigative journalist and author Charlotte Dennett in her book, Follow the Pipeline. Charlotte proves over and over that the influence of Western nations in the region has always stemmed from protecting their own interests and Israel is a perfect ally, self-serving with an American government. So, um, the way I see it, and uh, I don't know how I'm doing with time, if you let me know, George. The way I see it, and what I hope this group with is for the United States to. Oh, sorry. Okay, I'll, I'll make it quick. The way I see it, and the hope I like to see this group to leave with is for the United States to protect its interests in Lebanon. It will have to break from its past policies and look at Lebanon in a truly different light. Implementing a new US strategy for Lebanon would be a difficult task, given the country's many internal and external complexity, but it is a challenge worth pursuing. The opportunity for a more principled and consistent American approach in Lebanon, one that benefits Lebanon and advances both American interests and ideals, still exists, but the recent drums of war in the region serves as a stark reminder that the opportunity may not be around for much longer. I want to um, skip. Um, some stuff and I want to also tell you that uh, being in the um, member of the um, Wilf Middle East Peace and Justice Committee in the US, this committee has been over um, um, what, their, what their role is and looking into humanitarian needs in the Middle East since it is a Middle East Action Committee. Uh, recently, uh, the branch signed on on many calls for justice, including but not limited to calls on uh, protecting and promoting the human rights of Palestinian children under Israeli military occupation. We signed the bill HR 2407, 
on uh, it was it was introduced on November 14, 2017. On October 29, 2021, we signed the, the letter organized by the Center of Constitutional Rights, and also Wilf signed that. Wilf has also signed on June 27, 2022, the petition that started by Jews for Palestinian rights of return. The petition condemned the Anti-Defamation League for slandering HROs that condemn Israel's apartheid policies, laws, and actions, which subjugate Palestinians to second-class citizenship and destroys their life. And finally, uh, not finally, I know there's many, but this is what I have. Uh, Wilf has also signed uh, the Democracy for the Arab World Now, Dawn's letter to Biden and Blinken on August 23, 2022, regarding Israel criminalization and attempting to shut down seven prominent Palestinian NGOs. Um, and I'm done. Thank you. All right, then. Thanks so much, Nada. Um, we of the Black Liberation Caucus of Will are part of the uh, planning of this along with the Middle East Peace and Justice Action Committee. And we're pleased to have um, a statement of support from the BLC that Lucy Murphy will share. Lucy? Thank you, George. Um, first, I would like to thank Teresa el -Amin for inviting me to share our solidarity with the Palestinian people and also acknowledge Eyewitness Palestine, which raised the funds to make it possible for me to see Palestine for myself recently. Uh, one cannot speak of Palestine and overlook Gaza. I was not able to visit Gaza on my recent trip in June and July. However, recent attacks on Gaza following Joe Biden's visit to Israel have been shown to everyone in the world. In the US media, Palestinian Arabs are terrorists and Israeli Jews are the beleaguered allies of the US. However, the violence against preschool children and their mothers cannot be characterized as a battle the way National Public Radio has done. It is a massacre. I ask you to write to NPR and other news outlets to correct their descriptions of what is being done to the Palestinians with the military aid from the US government to the state of Israel. I also ask you to write to three people, your favorite state rep, your favorite US congressperson, your favorite US senator, to oppose the legislation which criminalizes any criticism of the state of Israel and legislation which blocks the transmission of resources to humanitarian, humanitarian organizations which provide educational and health services to Palestinians. I direct your attention to palestinelegal.org which will give you information about the legislation which makes the criticism of Israel illegal. Uh, perhaps someone can um, screen share the Palestine legal um, web page. Um, and for those who criticize Israeli apartheid and are accused of being anti-Semitic, I suggest the book, Reclaiming Judaism from Zionism, which is a collection of short bios of Jewish people from many walks of life who share your criticism of Israel's violation of human rights. What stood out on my visit was the rootedness of the Palestinian people, their long standing connection to the land, connection to family, connection to neighbors. This is something that has been destroyed in the United States. In the territory which became the United States, the people who understood the connection to the land and the connections to each other were condemned as savages and massacred. To those indigenous people, the idea of buying and selling land was inconceivable. 
but so-called Christians from Europe changed all of that. The land was transformed from earth mother to commodity and meant money was valued more than people. In the society which they have created on the land that they seized, elders are abandoned until they die. And then their descendants are pitted against each other as they grasp pieces of a crumbling ancestral inheritance. Neighbors are pitted against each other in a contest for prestige. The lies that justify the capitalist system have been told so often that we believe them. We live our lives in obedience to the lies, paying rents and mortgages to the system which stole the land. In Palestine, the connections are still recognized and felt by the Palestinians. Those connections are more real than the lies and abuses of the Israeli government. In high school, I hung out with students whose father raised money to plant invasive species trees in Palestine. I was told that those trees were planted to make the desert bloom. When I visited Palestine, I learned that those trees were used to cover the land where more than 400 Palestinian villages once stood. Those villagers had been massacred, the survivors driven into exile, and their homes destroyed. The olive trees which the Palestinians had planted centuries ago were uprooted. Trees familiar to the invaders were planted. The Zionists say that they came to a desert and made it bloom, but olives do not grow in the desert. The scientific evidence that olive trees have been cultivated in, Palestinian for, in Palestine for millennia counters the lie of a land without people and the lie about it being a desert. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If we continue to allow our US tax dollars to support the criminal activity of the Israeli government, the effects of those crimes will visit us. Some of us who are black are already suffering from the same abuses, dislocation and invisibilization. Thank you for your attention. I think we've reached the point where we're going to go to questions. A few of you have put them in the Q&A. And if there are more, please also put them there. Thank you, Lucy, for um, your statement there. It is very relevant and we appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go with the first couple of questions that were asked, and they were asked of Hanan. Um, the first one that I saw was from Farrell Brody, and it asked, what is the solution in Palestine? I do want to notice um, that um, Hanan gave a few things. She said that international law is there, but it's not enforced, um, and that we need to abide by the International Declaration of Human Rights, uh, that she notes a silence of the big powers, and that we need to reverse Trump's declaration that Jer Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine. She called for honest intervention and she called for the settlements to be stopped and evacuated. Uh, I want to tag on to that, the other question that was in the Q and A section, which was from Natalia Pantalaevna. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Excuse me for that. And she asked, what, what will displacement do, uh, or what displacement will occur if there is a demand to return to the 1967 borders now that things have progressed here in 2022? So this question to Hanan, <laughs> it's a lot there. Anon, you're muted. 
Now you hear me? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Well, this is a big question and a lot of discussion among the Palestinians. Shall we accept the one in 1967? And even Israel will not give 1967 because it changed all the, uh, the geography there. The other question and other suggestion was to have a democratic state with Palestinians and Israelis and Israel will not accept that. So what is the solution? What Israel is giving is 20% of our country, taking Jerusalem, settlements that are surrounding uh, Palestine. Uh, this is a very important question, what to do, who can help? Because if international law is silent, if the criminal law is silent, the big power standing firm with Israel, now Israel behave as if it is a lonely state in the world, she can rule, she can break all the, um, you know, human rights, all the laws. They don't listen to anybody. So how can we, we as Palestinians, you know, determine, we uh, struggle in, you know, in a very human way. And you see there was, there we reached to a standard that we will say enough. You know, if you notice every day, every minute, we have a pe people killed, house uh, demolished, people in prison. So who can stand firm with Palestine? And you know that the U.S. stand firm with Israel with all what they're doing. So we lost hope in the U.S. Then now we are looking for power, honest, to intervene to try to do uh, something to save the Palestinian. We, believe me, we are in, in a very dangerous situation. Now the whole city in Jerusalem, half of it is taking. The most they are planning in this holiday to go and you know destroy something of the mosque. All the people, they can enter any city at four o'clock in the morning or three o'clock in the morning and they destroy and take them in and imprison and kill. So what is the solution? Even the, you know, the international law, if it's not a practice, cannot solve these problems. Where is the power of Palestine? We are fighting fully equipped armed country, supported by the big powers in the world. What the Palestinian can do except to determine, to steadfast, to, to stay in their, their country to protect their identity. But I'm telling you very frankly, in this period of time, we are living under a dangerous situation and we don't know how tomorrow will be. President Abbas is going to declare in the meeting of the United Nations uh, the recognition of Palestine as a state and a full state, as I said in my speech. But you know, there is a veto. I am not sure if they will accept or not. So we will see. And this can you give you an example how to implement the resolution concerning Palestine, how to have a free Palestine. I think this question is very difficult to answer when we knew and view what's going on in the world and how the big powers stand firm with uh, another state with different with Palestine state. So this is the, the situation that we are living now in it. Thanks so much, Anand. Um, there's a question here directed towards Nada. Um, and Nada, the question is about what you shared about the fig trees being taken away and replaced with blooming invasive species. The question asks, are these invasive species now abundant in Palestine? Do you remember the species that were planted? Uh, George, I think it wasn't me that I shared this. It was, uh, it was uh, somebody else um, trying to think of the name, but it wasn't me that I shared this. About the uh, plants being replaced? Hollow, yes. was that you? I don't uh, think that was, was uh, George, that was me. And I typed the answer in the chat uh, to the person. Um, it was uh, invasive. I, what I saw were invasive species of pine. 
not native, non-native pine trees. Thanks so much for providing that answer in the chat, Lucy. Um, is there another question that you see, Barbara, that we need to pose? Yes, Natalia Pantalev, again, I'm not pronouncing it correctly, uh, asked basically, how can we make progress against the dark money that's pro-Israel um, within the US? And I assume that that's because if we do, there might be a change in US policy. And um, I'm guessing that that might be um, something that, uh, again, Hanan would probably answer, but uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's for me, the question? Go ahead, please. Oh, my dear, I think what you do and this the question is very important. I first highly appreciate all the groups and uh, the Jewish groups, even in the US, who support the Palestinian justice. I think these groups can affect, but it needs more power, you know, because the states that hold the issue in its depth in the US. What you can see, what you can do through the government, through the councils, through all the parties in the US, how can we affect? It's now growing up better than it was before, but it needs more efforts. We have to think how to put pressure on the government, on the president, how? This is maybe you know more than me how to do it in the US, but we feel that in the US, the voice of you and the other people can be heard internationally. It can be very much effective. Even you can another uh, kind of power to be used in the United Nations to the uh, to to put forward the issues of Palestine, the uh, resolutions on on Palestine, to make more meetings with the big powers, the personalities can affect the policy. But you know, it's not an easy task. I must tell you because I know how things going in the US and in another country, but we have to to try whatever we, whatever difficulties we, we find, we have to try to go ahead with it. Contact other governments from different places in the world to see how can we count a true voice that declare the truth that can support, you know, the, the Palestinian in taking the right and live normally as any other people in the world. And not only we think about Palestine, we also think about other areas of conflict. They have problems, like in Lebanon, our sisters, they, they explain and declare it's related to each other because we, lots, we have lots of refugees in there. So this is very important question. And I think it's very complicated question, not because it cannot be solved, but the problem because some of the big powers hold the issue and they don't want to make solution. And especially when Biden, President Biden came to Palestine and he didn't say anything, he didn't promise anything. And fortunately he said, I'm very sorry. I don't find solution to Palestine this state now, but I will help the Palestinian with economic. Imagine, forget your country and think about money. This is very difficult. How the states, the other states, can put pressure on the U.S.? Our, yani our work and our friends in all over the world stand firm with us, raising our voice of our rights, but we need support of big powers. Whenever we issue any article or any point in the U.S., in the United Nations, so the veto is there. The veto is there. So how? How can we work? This is the question, Yanni, that you yourself, you know, how complicated is the issue when still U.S. is supporting Israel and send arms and even fight with them in different areas, in different, when they see the balance of any power in the Palestinian or in the Arab world, the U.S. military service interfere. So this is a big question. And from here is the danger 
and from here is the solution. Thank you, Hanan. So we do have both danger and solutions. Yeah. What is to be done? Um, we don't know all of what is to be done, but we do know that we can all do something. Yeah. We've had some good recommendations today from our speakers. Um, and there are some good recommendations in the chat now. Mm -hmm. As a closing, um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us. I wanna thank our speakers, all of the resources that you made available. And I heard you, Hanan, when you said that the big powers, and the US is certainly one of those, won't listen. So we have to push the international law. We have to push the criminal law. We have to make it clear as feminist peacemakers that we do not agree with what the US is doing. And we have to be consistent and loud. Thank you all for joining us today. Keep up the good fight. Goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you so much for all the solidarity and for inviting us. Thank you.